He was a, uh, a college football coach uh, for Carlisle. And during, the game, uh, during a game uh, that he was getting ready to have against Syracuse, so it was Syracuse versus Carlisle, as the teams made ready for the game, the Carlisle coach, Pop Warner, and obviously you guys know that, and he, if you've been around football, you know that name Pop Warner because they have like little leagues you know, for kids. They call them Pop Warner Leagues, and it's named after him. But he decided to bend the rules to give his team the upper hand. He was a good coach, but he, he wasn't above bending the rules when it was to his advantage. And sometimes people have heard this, you know, that, you know, if you're, if you're not cheating, you're not trying. That's, that's not what I'm trying to get across here. But uh, before the game, what he did, he's, he saw, uh, he had them, sorry, he had them sew what he, looked like footballs to the front of the jerseys. So that the other team wouldn't be able to tell who had the ball. Now, there isn't any written rule against it, but obviously it violated the principles of fair play. Do you think? This morning, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12, the Bible reads, All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me. But I will, uh, I will not be brought under the power of any. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that this morning as we read your word, as we go through your word, Lord, uh, that it would fall upon the fertile soil of our hearts. As we've gone through this week cultivating the ground upon you know, which you know, for growth, Lord, I pray that all the weeds uh, be removed, and Lord, that as you water those seeds, that it grows and we are able to grow. And Lord, I pray that this morning that you would fill me with your spirit. And Lord, that your message would be clearly conveyed this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, for the next few moments, I want to talk to you about powerful principles for proper practice. Now, try and say that five times fast. Or in other words, everything is lawful, but not expedient. Everything is lawful, but not expedient. There are a lot of Christians who wish the Bible contained specific rules governing every possible situation in life. Then they think that they would be able, uh, they, would, they would know what they should do in every single situation. Because sometimes people sit there and say, well, what should I do in this situation, right? They would know what they could, uh, what they could and what they could not do. A book like that obviously would be too big to read. It would be so, so thick and everything else that we'd not be, uh, we wouldn't be able to get through every single uh, portion of it. So, man, and the thing is that a book that big, most people wouldn't read it. There's something like that, actually. You know, the, the Jewish people believe in the Talmud, which is 30 volumes, and it usually spans about that wide. And that's just the rabbinical teachings or the teachings of the rabbis that they say that they're following and which they're not. But anyways, and uh, if you talk to any of them, I would say nearly all of them have said that they've never read the entire thing. Now, you would think that something like that, that, you know, that's a religious teaching or something like that, that they would have actually read the entire thing before they're actually teaching that to other people, right? But it's the same in this situation, that if we knew what we could and couldn't do, like we, if we had everything, every detail of life, everything down to the minute, you know, uh, you know or every down, down to that minute detail, we wouldn't read it anyways. God has, however, given us a book that contains all the principles that we need to be able to live life for him in this world. And what book is that? That's the Word of God, right? The Bible. He's given us you know, all these situations. And in, ver- uh, in verse 10 and uh, on through uh, in chapter 10, Paul lays out several very important principles for the Corinthian believers. You see, he is writing to some very immature Christians. Some, you know, they will call them babes in Christ. He tells them, and in, in, uh, uh, in, in, uh, that's what he calls them in chapter uh, 3, verse 1. He calls them babes in Christ. He reminds them that like little children, they think there is a rule for everything. I mean, think about this. If you have children play, they're just playing, out playing, doing whatever they like to do. It won't be long before you hear somebody say, that's not fair. Right? Or am I the only one who has ever experienced that? 
that they'll go on, they'll be playing, everything's getting along, and then all of a sudden somebody comes up with something, and they say, that's not fair. Kids need, by the way, kids need uh, rules. Kids need rules, and they actually love rules because, you know, the reason why they love rules is because then they can bring them back on those people that say, well, no, you know, that's not fair because it's the rule right here says this. As children grow up and become, uh, become old enough to leave home, we lay out all kinds of rules for them to, uh, to go by, right? When they were growing up, we gave them all kinds of rules, and as they get ready to go out into the world, we hope and pray that all the, you know, the rules that we've given them from the Word of God, what, what the Bible teaches, actually is in their, mind, uh, in their mind and in their hearts. But like I said, uh, when, they, uh, when they grow up, there's not much we can really go about you know, telling them to do, right? When they're old enough, we, can't, you know, we can kind of give them advice that they ask. And we know that there are some people out there, you know, some parents out there that don't um, give advice that is asked for, but they'll give it anyways. But obviously, as we get, old, you know, as we get older and stuff like that, and, and the kids get older, that's what's going to happen. They're going to leave our house, and then hopefully we've, ta- we've taught them well. Today, I want, like I said, I want to share with you for a few moments that everything is lawful, but not everything is expedient. That God gives us a standard by which we can live our lives. These principles, if practiced, will teach you how to live life and respond to any questionable situation or activity. As we grow in Christ, we need to be liberated or freed from the legalism of rules. What's legalism? Legalism is that trying to find everything down to the minute detail, saying, I don't think you understand. And we try to impose other rules upon other people that are not actually biblical, right? And we need to learn to apply these principles, uh, 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 these are principles to our lives that we might know how to live without someone having to tell us every move we make. The ability, uh, the ability to make decisions wisely is a mark of maturity. These, are rule, uh, these aren't rules. These are lessons that every, Christians, every Christian would, be, uh, would do well to learn and to use. First principle I want to talk to you about is, because you know, some of you say, I don't understand what that word expedient means. Well, the first principle I want to talk to you about is the principle of a expediency. In verse 12, he talks about this. Obviously, he says, all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. That word, you know, expedient just means useful or profitable, beneficial. So, in other words, everything is, you know, permissible or everything is lawful, but not everything is beneficial. Not everything is going to benefit you in your life, right? Obviously, you know, uh, there's, there's two questions that are raised here that can help us decide whether something is right or wrong. Is it lawful? Is there any word from God concerning the matter? In other words, if we, if we know the Bible says, you know, thou shalt not commit adultery, do we really need to sit there and go, gee, I wonder what that means? Or thou shalt not steal, or thou shalt not kill. Do we really need to go on there and say, I, I don't really know what that means? But we obviously do, right? When God speaks on an issue, when God has talked about it, it's already been settled in heaven. We know that, uh, we know that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it is, what, profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, right? So if God's Word has spoken specifically on it, you know it, right? And there are some, obviously some very clear uh, very clear moral absolutes. Even though that nowadays people want to be, you know, they want to go off of what they call, you know, relative relativism, or being, you know, is that relevant? You know, is that relevant or whatever? That's not really relevant now, and all sort of kind of stuff. That there's no basically no moral absolutes. That there's no absolutes, you know, in the Bible or anything else. They want to kind of make up their own. It, it goes along this. Well, I'm glad that works for you, but this works for me. Just because something works for somebody else does not mean it's true. Right? Just because something works for you does not mean it's truth. We need to go to God's word, and if God's word specifically talks about it, we need to follow it. You say, well, that sounds legalistic. No, it isn't. God is trying to make sure that you you live your life with abundance. 
and to the full, right? He's not, you know, some, uh, you know, some, some Debbie Downer or some, like, you know, some party pooper out there that says, oh, you can't have any fun. No, he wrote these things so you could have fun in this life. Because when we do things God's way, we end up, we tend to, you know, have a better time than we would if we said, you know, I don't want to do that. I want to go against God's word. The second question, so I asked the first question is, is it lawful? The next one is, is it expedient? And like I said, is it useful or profitable? Does it bring us toward a destination of where we want to go? Every decision or activity either moves us toward or away from Jesus Christ. Every decision that we make, every activity that we make will either bring us toward Jesus or away from him. Ask yourself, does this thing bring me closer to Jesus? If it doesn't, then it's wrong. It's like this. Every Christian, every believer should have goals in their life. We should follow them, right? What's our main goal? I believe Paul summarizes this well in Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 through 15 that says, Brethren, I count not myself to have attained, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before I press toward the mark for the, pri- uh, the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us, therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if, any, if in anything ye be uh, otherwise minded, God shall reveal this even unto you. Our goal should be what? To draw closer to him to press toward the goal of Jesus Christ, to look more like him, to be like more like him, to act more like him, to follow him. So like I said, does this thing get me closer to where I want to be or I need to be or not? Does this get me closer to it? Is it useful? Is it beneficial? Here's the thing. I can do anything I please And it will not make me unsaved. However, not everything I can do will help me grow as a Christian and will bring me closer to my uh, my destination. Does that make sense? You can say, you know what, you know, I'm going to go ahead and do this. It's you know not a problem. It's not an issue. But the problem is, is it's not getting uh, it's not getting you closer to Him. And usually, if we have that attitude of, well, I'm going to do this anyways. I know that blah blah. You know that I shouldn't. That's a problem right there, right? If we know that, the Bible says that if we know uh, what we ought to do and don't do it, what is it? It's sin. Because you know why? Because the Holy Spirit is going to speak to you about issues. Whether it's containing God's word or not. Like I said, not every single minute detail, every single situation in life is is in God's word, but the principles are there. And it doesn't matter what it is. God has a plan for you and me, right? God loves the believer. He he loves people in general. He wants them to get saved. But you know what? You can't do any more for God to love you, and you can't do anything less. God loves you. The Bible says that nothing shall be able to separate us from the love of Christ. Ephesians 4.13 says, Till we all come in the unity of the faith, of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the sta- uh, stature of the fullness of Christ, that we have that unity. The second principle I want to talk to you about is the principle of enslavement. The principle of enslavement. When he, uh, when he says in verse 12, the latter part of it, where he says that, but I will not be brought under the power of any. To be brought under the power means to be enslaved. In other words, I will not become a slave to it. If there's something you know, uh, that I'm questioning or going, uh, going about or say, you know, I'm not really sure, I'm not going to become a slave to it. That's what Paul is you know, saying here. He's saying the fact is, is that if I do something and all of a sudden I find myself enslaved to it, it's definitely wrong, obviously. Right? We were all slaves at one time. We were all slaves to sin. 
but we have been delivered by the Lord Jesus Christ. So why go back to that? Now, I'm not talking to you about the fact of, of you know, like of, of sinless perfection, of, of being perfect. But I'm saying those things, you know, the weird thing is, is that we see this throughout Scripture, but I also see it in people's lives, is the fact that they will get saved. They know the, you know, the bondage that they were in. They know the slavery that they were in to whatever it was, whether it was, you know, being an alcoholic or, or, or smoking or whatever it is. But then they'll say, you know what? Just like the, uh, just like the Hebrews did, and just like the Israelites did, you know, back, you know, in Exodus, it was so much better back in Egypt. And they go, you know what? I remember it was it was the best. I mean, we got three square meals a day. We got. And you ever notice that when you read that account, is the fact that they seem to miss out on the fact that they were being beaten every single day. That they were enslaved, that they were, you know, worked until they basically were falling, you know, collapsing on the ground because they had worked them so hard. They don't talk about that. They go, it was so great, you know, we had three square meals, we were out here in the middle of the desert, we were in whatever. And you say, well, that would never happen to me. But I've heard it many a times where a person says, well, we'll come back and say, you know what, man, I remember, I remember what I used to do. That wasn't really a problem. I think I can handle it now. That's the same thing that the Israelites did when they were, you know, uh, when God set them free. Don't fall into that trap. Romans 6.14 says this, For sin shall not, uh, shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Now, anything outside, uh, you know, outside of the fact that of Jesus Controlling in your life is sin. We said that we said that before. That if we know that you know what we ought to do, but yet we don't do it, it is sin, right? There are two, only two forces in operation in this world: either we are for God or we are against God. Here's a here's the uh, ironic thing: the lost man or the unsaved person thinks uh, thinks that they are in control. But he isn't. He thinks I can do whatever I want. I'm going to go out there and do what you know. You know this is great. I can control my life. I can do everything else. But the thing is, is that how many times have you met somebody like that that says I can do whatever I want. I can leave the house whenever I want. I can do whatever. All these things. And then at the end of it, you begin to talk to them. They say, you know what? My life is in shambles. It is a mess. It is chaotic. It is in chaos. I don't know what to do. Oftentimes, you know, people will deny it. But at the end of the day, they will sit there and they will realize how out of control that their life actually is when they're not saved. And the thing is, is that it's foreign to them because the thing is that you start talking to them about Jesus Christ and about how he could do all these things in their life, that you save them from hell and all these things. And it's foreign to them because the thing is, is that they want their what? Independence. They don't want to be subject to somebody, even though that they don't realize that they are subject to somebody, which is the devil. But here's the thing, that person, they, they chose their actions, but they didn't choose the consequences of those actions. The reason why is because he is a slave to the will of the devil. And if there's anyone that, you know, that's listening that is not saved this morning, I, I hope and I pray that they would give their heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, that they would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ today because the, uh, God's word says that he will set you free. John 8, 36, if the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. We need to search our lives and be sure that no habit, attitude, activity, pursuit, etc. has us enslaved. If you are struggling with some sort of besetting sin, some you know, sin that seems like it's surrounding you or encompassing you or something that you just can't shake off, realize that Jesus Christ can set you free today. The third principle is the principle of example. Flip over in your Bibles to uh, just a couple pages over to chapter 8. Chapter 8, verse 8.
1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 8, and we're going to read down uh, uh, through the end of the chapter. But meat, uh, but meat uh, commend, uh, commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. For if, uh, if any man see thee, which uh, hast knowledge, sit at uh, meat in the, the idol's temple, shall not, uh, shall not the conscience of, of him which is weak be emboldened to eat uh, those things which, uh, which are offered to idols. And through thy knowledge shall the weak, uh, the weak brother perish, for whom Christ, uh, for whom Christ died. But when uh, ye sin, so do against, so against the brethren, and wound their weak conscience. Ye sin against uh, Christ. Wherefore, if meat make my uh, make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh, while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. And what you need to understand, obviously, in, in, in Corinth, is that where Paul lived, this was a pagan society. They didn't love Jesus Christ. They didn't hear about Jesus Christ. They were just they were doing everything apart from the Lord. So many of the, of the people who lived there practiced idol worship. They would have like little statues or all, all those things. And they would sacrifice a sheep or a goat to their God. And then they would sell the meat to the butcher at the meat, at the meat market. So they would sacrifice the animal to their God. Then they would go sell it to the butcher so he could sell it. He in turn would make, uh, would make the meat available to the public at a discount price. It was perfectly good meat, and the price was right, so some Christians would buy this, buy, and eat the meat. Other Christians, however, felt that God's people shouldn't eat uh, this meat because it had been offered to devils. Those opposing camps began to argue bitterly about this issue, and they turned to Paul for help. And he, through the inspiration of the Lord, gave them this principle of example. Paul did, Paul did not give them an ironclad rule, but rather he gave them a principle. He said that meat would not make you better, neither would it make you worse. However, his advice was this, don't do anything that would, uh, that would make you a stumbling block to another believer. This, uh, the issue is not, will it hurt me? The, the question is, could it hurt my brother? That's where people oftentimes say, I can do everything. I, I have liberty in Christ. I have freedom in Christ to do whatever I want and don't care about that their brother or their sister in the Lord sees what they're doing and it's causing them to stumble. They don't even ask, is this a problem for you? They'll just go ahead and do it. And that's the issue that he says. It's just the meat, whether it's sacrificed to idols or anything else, doesn't matter. It's, it doesn't make you any better, it doesn't make you any worse. But does it cause your brother or sister to stumble in Christ? Does it cause them to, you know, uh, to begin to wonder, can it hurt my brother? We are, all, we are to, to do, as is, as is spoken in Philippians 4, 2, it says, they be of the same mind in the Lord. The thing is, is that what we need to realize is that others are supposed to come first. Others are supposed to come first. And we live in a culture that is very me-centric. It's all about me. You say, well, I don't understand that. It's not all about me. Do you have an iPhone? Think about that name. iPhone. It's all about me. Everything is, is about what can I get out of this. And this is the reason why we have such a selfish culture, but also, I believe, a very mentally ill culture. A very mentally detached culture. Because everything is about me and not about anybody else. Because if you hear you know, uh, anything, you know, the, how does this, this affect me? This is about me. How can I be me, me, me? It reminds me of the scene from Finding Nemo. If you've never seen the movie, you may not know this. But if you've seen it, you know. 
where the seagulls are going on there, all of a sudden something falls in the water. Mine, 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 mine. And that's the culture that we live in. It's a very me-centered culture that we live in. And Paul flips everything on his head. So the thing is, is that the church in Corinth is not that much different than the church in America. And Paul flips it on his head and says, you know what? It's not about you. It's about your brother and sister in Christ. Are you hurting them? Are you offending them by your decisions that you're making? And this, I mean, obviously goes to a certain extent because some people you're going to offend no matter what you do. But if you're doing, you're saying, you know what? I can, you know, what did Paul say? He said, you know what? If, if it's going to offend somebody that I'm eating meat, I says, I won't even eat meat. And we have to ask ourselves, are we willing to almost do that same thing? If it offends somebody, are we saying, you know what, I just won't do it at all? Because some people say, you know, man, I, I like meat. I got to have me a good burger or a good steak. I better stop or else I'm going to get people hungry. But he's using that as an, you know, an analogy of saying, what are you doing in your life? Yes, everything is lawful, you're, you're allowed to, but is it beneficial for, for the body of Christ? Does it help others? Each side thought that they were right and possessed a greater insight into the issue. But Paul reminds them that brotherly love must be the main objective. If you look at verse 1 of, uh, of chapter 8 of 1 Corinthians, it says this, Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. I mean, think about what he said there. He says, we all have knowledge. But then he goes on to say, knowledge puffs up. Paul, you know, is talking about the fact that when you get a lot of knowledge, you know, sometimes if we don't watch it, what ends up happening is that we get a big head. We go, well, you know, I've been studying the Bible for 20 years, and you, new Christian, you've only been studying for a week. What do you know? So then he goes on to the next part and says, but charity. You know what charity is? Charity is something that you do that you don't have to do. Why? Because you're looking out for the other person. And what does he say about charity? It edifies, it builds up, it encourages, it strengthens. It's not, he's not saying that it's wrong to have knowledge. It is good to have knowledge, but keep your knowledge in check. Make sure the fact is that you're looking out for your brother or your sister in Christ and making sure that you're doing everything so they can grow as well as you. And the amazing thing is, is that when you see others grow, you grow. I could, uh, every single week that I've come in, ever since, I'm just going to use Doc as an example. I'm sorry, Doc. I'm just going to use Doc as an example. But ever since Doc has said, I'm going to step out of my comfort zone and teach Sunday school, which, we, by the way, we need some new Sunday school teachers coming up because, you know, the end of this session is ending, uh, you know, soon. But here's the thing. Ever since he has said, yes, Lord, I am going to step out of my comfort zone and put others, you know, in front of me, you know, or before me, every single week he says, he'll come up to me and say, hey, pastor, this is what I learned. This is amazing. I am growing so much. It's amazing that when you invest in others, what ends up happening? The investment comes back to you. You and I possess a great liberty in the Lord and could, do, uh, and could lawfully do many things, but we must always be mindful of the example we are setting for others. We must never do anything that would cause our, another brother to stumble. I think about this, you know, for example, because like I said, he talks about everything is lawful, but not everything is permissible, right? I think about like, you know, for myself, swearing. I used to, uh, I used to cuss and swear and all the time before I was saved, and even after I was saved. And I had to ask myself this question because... I had gotten to the point to where it just seemed like certain words just fit a situation. But in reality, what the, you know, it ultimately came down to was is that I was 
using, you know, I was actually kind of being dumb in a way by using these swear words because it didn't have, I didn't have to think as hard. As opposed to saying what I actually really wanted to say, right? But that wasn't the point. I felt the fact that I should stop swearing. Why? Because it was not benefiting those around me who were younger in the Lord. And I had to stop. And I'm not telling you this as a, ooh, pastor, you're so, no, I'm telling you that there's different areas that we need to sit there and ask ourselves, does this help my brother and sister in Christ? The Christian must always, we must always consider the brethren before ourselves. Matthew 18, verse 6, uh, six says this, But whosoever shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. What example, parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, are you setting for your children? Because your kids should look to you, and I'm not saying you're going to be perfect. You're not going to be perfect. I feel like I have to you know, keep prefacing that. You're not going to be perfect. But are you striving to show them the Lord? Are you striving to bring them closer to the Lord? Because your kids know you mess up. And when you mess up, fess up. Tell them you're sorry. Principle number four. See, how many principles are there? There's a couple more. Principle number four, the principle of edification. Flip over a, a, couple, a, a page or so to chapter 10. Let's look at verse 23. It says, All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. Sound familiar? All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. He says it's the same thing, in this, you know, but in a different way. He says, it may be lawful for me to do with it. I'm not going to lose you know, my salvation in it, but the thing is, is that it's not going to build somebody else up. It's not going to encourage them. It's not going to strengthen them in their walk, right? Everything that we do in life either honors or dishonors God. Every conversation, every habit, every relationship, every business deal, every vacation, every book we read, every film we watch, every, all the music we listen to, Etc. I can go on and on. But everything we do either honors or dishonors God. I remember when I was newly saved about 25 plus years ago. I had a, I, I had a, a, a bracelet or a, you know, a wristband you know, on, on my arm. And it had the initials of WWJD. For those of you that weren't around during that time period, you were like, what, what, is, what does WWJD mean? It means, what would Jesus do? And it was good for me to have that. You know, I wore it, not, you know, some people go, oh, look, he's a Christian. He's wearing that WWJD. I wore it because it helped remind me, would Jesus be doing this? We need to learn, our, uh, learn to ask ourselves this question. What, uh, what, oh, sorry, what would I do if Jesus were with me? You know why? Because he is. He will never leave you nor forsake you. you li- we like that verse when we're having a rough time or we're having all kinds of issues going on. You know, like we were in the middle of a storm and we feel all these things going on. Like, oh, the Bible says he will never leave me nor forsake me. But we don't like it when things are going well or we're doing something that we don't or that we shouldn't be doing. And realize, if Jesus were, because like some people, you know, I remember some people will come up and say that they want to watch this movie, and I'm just throwing this out for an example. They want to watch this movie, or this movie, or this movie. And somebody came up to him and said, if Jesus were sitting on the couch with you while you're watching that movie, would it bring honor or dishonor to him? Would he be happy that you're watching it or not happy? Would he be sad about it? 
You say, well, Pastor, this sounds really legalistic. No, it's not. Because think about it. If you're married, everything about your life when you got married, you said, I am preferring the other one. If you have kids, and moms know this, you know, moms know this really well, you're not only preferring your husband, but you're also preferring your kids over yourself. I'm not saying that husbands don't, but you know that oftentimes, you know, if, if husbands are, are you know you're working or anything else, then they have to, they'll come home and, and be able to take care of it. But moms know who's the first person when they scrape their knee. Who do they go to, mom? I see. I consider it, and I'm not saying this, you know, in a bad way. I consider it a special occasion, and I almost. It almost warms, you know, almost like warms my heart when my daughter comes up to me with an injury and says, Dad, I need you. Because I know that's a rare event because most of the time it's mom. And I'm not saying that I want my daughter to get hurt or injured or anything else. I'm just going, wow, this is a special occasion. You know, I, I, get, to, I get to hug on my daughter for a little bit because, you know, she wants me at this point. Remember, as a Christian, everything you do reflects back on God. It can be positive or negative. Philippians chapter 1, verse 27 says this, Only let your conversation be as it becomes the gospel of Christ. That whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And you say, well, that's conversation, that's talking, that's not all the other stuff. Well, actually, a conversation literally means in the general course of manners, behavior, and talking about uh, in respect to morals. It's everything about your life. So, in other words, let your life, let your life be as becomes the gospel of Christ. That whether I come and see you or else be absent. So what is he saying? If I come and see you, are you just doing it because I'm there? Or are you doing it when I'm not there too? It's often said that, you know, integrity and character are those things that you do when no one else is looking. Would you do that even if, even if you didn't get praise for it? That can be hard sometimes because sometimes you're going, man, I've done an awful lot. I just like a thank you. But you know what? The Bible says don't become weary in well-doing. For at the appointed time you shall receive. Principle number five, and we have one more after this, so there's six principles. Principle five, the principle of evangelism. Stay in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, but go down to verses 32 and 33. It's a, uh, the Bible reads, Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God, even as I please all men in all things, not seeking my, uh, my own profit, but the profit of many that they might be saved. In other words, Paul says, you know what? I do all things to all men that I might win some to Christ. His whole purpose is the fact that if, if, if I'm not seeking my own good, if I'm not being selfish, if I'm not doing that thing, what's going to end up happening? That most likely some of those people are going to get saved. And I would, I, would, I would venture to say that every single person within you know, the sound of my voice says that I, that I want to live in such a way that brings people to Jesus Christ, that brings people out of hell and into his marvelous light, that, that people are going to heaven because of you, not in spite of it. Amen? I think I missed a principle. Did I talk to you about the principle of edification? I'm going to go back to it then. <laughs> Let me finish with evangelism and I'll come back to edification. Like I said, Paul's desire is that he did not uh, want to turn off uh, anyone to the gospel by his lifestyle. Uh, you know, so he strove to be inoffensive and be as an open book in his walk with the Lord. He didn't offend people on purpose. But he also didn't change the Bible to say 
something different so he wouldn't offend somebody. You don't ever change the Bible. The Bible will offend people anyways. The Bible even tells you that it will offend people. But you live your life in such a way as to not offend. So how is that possible? You do what the Bible says. We know that people are watching you. Does your life move men toward men and women toward God or away from them? Your, your, life, uh, your lifestyle does matter. What you do speaks so loud that people cannot hear what you're saying. People will watch you before they believe you. Let's go back to number four, which is the principle of edification. That was actually principle six that you heard about evangelism. That uh, Verse 23 of chapter 10. It says, all things, like I said before, it says, all things are, are lawful for me, but not all things are expedient. All things are lawful for me, but not all things, edif- all things uh, edify not. Like I said, that word edify means to build up. It's everything you say, do, and hear is either building, some, uh, building you up or tearing you down. Every, like I said, every conversation, every relationship, every activity must be judged by the same principle. Does this thing make me stronger in the Lord or does it weaken my walk with Jesus? All of life should be lived in such a way as it, uh, as it does nothing but build us up in the Lord Jesus. Do the things you are doing make you stronger for him? If not, they need to go. If there's something in your life that does not strengthen you, get rid of it. Number five is the principle of exaltation. Verse 31 of chapter 10. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. And I've hit that principle about everything that we in life we do either honors or dishonors God. And as every conversation, habit, relationship, business deal, because sometimes people think that as soon as you walk out the side of the building that there's their church life and then there's their regular life. If you're doing business but you're being shady about it, it's not good. People know when you're lying to them. People know that when you're jacking up the price on something that you know that, you know, just because you can. Your vacation. Las Vegas has, you know, has a slogan, whatever happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. No, whatever happens in Vegas will follow you afterwards. So don't just think, well, I can, I can do this, I can, I can say this, I can wear this, I can do whatever I want because I'm on vacation. I don't have to go. You know, here, here's the thing, that, you know, oftentimes that I've heard from people, and just think about this, you know, I'm not saying that you have to, but oftentimes people go on vacation and they say, well, you know, I don't, it's Sunday. Oh, man, it's going to be awesome to not go to church. If I, I'll just tell you this, if I'm not able to go to church while I'm on vacation, I will make sure that I spend, you know, some extra time with the Lord that day because, you know what, just because of the fact that I'm on vacation does not mean that all of a sudden, like, I'm taking a break from Jesus or I'm taking a vacation from the Lord. I mean, that's just my, you know, that's, you know, that's my thought, you know, I'll process, you know, with the whole entire thing. But remember, everything that we do either honors or dishonors him. We should strive to reach everyone we come in contact with for Jesus Christ. But we will be ineffective as long as our talk and our walk do not agree. If people see you talking one way, but yet living another way, they're not going to listen to you. The Bible talks about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2. It says this, Ye are an epistle or a letter written in our hearts, Known and read of all men. He's saying the fact is, is that all people read you, look upon you, and you know what? Look for you to be an example. You say, man, pastor, that sounds like a a big, big undertaking. I I don't know if I can handle that. Just do what God's word does. Don't sit there and be like, okay, well, so-and-so said I should do this, and -and so-and-so said I should do that. No, do what God's word says. And then we go back to that principle of 
asking ourselves, is this going to bring me closer to Jesus or take away? Is me, by, by doing this, is this going to cause a problem for somebody else? Then I'm going to look out and say, you know what, no, I'm not going to do it. This is a hard principle for a lot of people to understand because most people say, well, I don't care what the other person thinks. I'm a you know, believer. I don't have a problem with this. It's not that, that's not the point. Just because you don't have a problem with it does not mean that the other person that you're trying to be an example for may have a problem with it or may, you know, may be a stumbling block for them. And I'm not saying you should walk around on eggshells. Everywhere you go. But if somebody comes up to you and says, hey, you know what? What you, what you just did there, you know, I, I'm just having a really hard time with. And usually if they say that they're having a really hard time with, just say, you know what? I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. But ultimately, the reason why we're doing it is because we want to bring others to Jesus Christ. We want to be that example. It's funny because I remember when I was growing up and the big thing back then was role models. It still is today, but it just started becoming really, really popular when, when you have different athletes come out and say, well, I'm not a role model. I remember Charles Barkley was one of the ones that always, I'm not a role model. Everyone is. Everybody looks to you, to some other people, to see, you know what, is it consistent? As much as Charles Barkley says that he is not a role model, he, he is a role model. People want to try and skirt around the issue so they don't have to be accountable for the things that they say and do, but they're going to be accountable with everything that they say and do. Just remember, everybody, it says, is going to know and read you. So if you and I take these six principles and live our lives by them, we will be a blessing to the Lord's work in the world. If we just follow those six, you know, those six principles and say, you know what, if we follow those things, we are going to be a blessing to those around us. Then when we meet the Lord Jesus Christ face to face, he will say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. That's what I want to hear. Do you? Or do you want to hear, okay, well, you're a servant, and you made it. I'd rather hear, one, uh, well done, go thy good and faithful servant. Like I said, I don't know about you, but that's what I want to hear. Doing these things in regards to the issues of life will make that, will make that hope a reality. Let me go through those uh, principles again. Number one was what? The principle of expediency. It means, you know, uh, what? Does it bring me closer towards that destination of where I want to go? Does it, bring, does, it, does it bring me closer to Jesus Christ? Number two, the principle of enslavement. That we have the attitude that I am not going to become a slave to anything. Number three, the principle of example is that our, the example that we're living before people, are we willing to sit there and say, you know what, I won't do it because it offends you or is a stumbling block to you? That we are all of the same mind. Principle number four is principle of the principle of edification, which is, you know, that we are there to edify, that everything that we do in our life is to edify, it is to build up other people. It is to build us up as well. The principle of exaltation is that everything in my life will do either, it will either honor God or dishonor God. And principle six is the principle, uh, principle of evangelism, which is that my life, that I should live my life in such a way, uh, uh, such a way that others will see my life and want to know Jesus Christ. If we follow those six principles, we are going to be a blessing to the kingdom of God and to his work. Amen? Oftentimes, I think so many people say, you know what? I'm going to give in this offering so that way others can reach people 
with the gospel. That's fine. That's great. That's a good thing to do. But we need to start at home and say, you know what? Am I living in such a way that I'm saying I'm preferring the other person over myself?